Hello, everybody. What an honor to be up here to speaking, speaking with you today. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Melissa Tate. I am a legal immigrant from Zimbabwe. At, yes. At the age of 19, I left everything and everybody I knew to come to the United States to study. Now, this is very typical for a Zimbabwean family to send their kids to study abroad, but it just so happened that at the time that I was supposed to come to the United States to study, our country was going through a devastating economic collapse. Things were so bad that I remember being in the grocery store with my mother and putting things in the cart at one price, and by the time we got to the checkout, the price had gone up. People were waking up to find out that everything that they'd ever saved for their entire life was worthless. At the height of things, we were printing $100 trillion bills, and that's what Marxism will do to your country. So needless to say, my mother could not afford to send me to the United States to study, but because she's a woman of faith, she declared that you are going to go to America by faith because the Lord our God is going to provide for you according to his riches and his glory. Yes. <laughs> So by faith, I arrived in the United States, and by the grace of God and hard work, I was able to pay my way through college. I graduated with a business degree, and I worked as an investment advisor for about three years, and then I started my own business. Now, I started my business in e-commerce at a time when e-commerce was really beginning to take off. So at the age of 20, by the time I was 27 years old, I had a business that was doing seven figures in revenue. I had multiple employees, and my husband and I were traveling around the world and basically living the American dream. So when I hear this narrative that America is systemically racist and oppressive to minorities, I know this to be completely false. Yes. <laughs> yes. As a black woman who came to the United States with nothing but $300 in her pocket and a suitcase, and within a relatively short time was able to make something of myself, I have felt that the Lord has called me to speak out against the slander of this great nation. Now, I haven't always been involved in politics, and the story about how I got involved is actually a very interesting one. So I had basically checked out of politics. I was not happy with the direction that President Obama was taking the country. But in 2015, I got excited because two of my favorite candidates were running for president, and that's Dr. Ben Carson and Senator Ted Cruz. And I was not paying attention to, Pres to Trump. <laughs> in fact, I thought his campaign was a bit of a distraction, so I was not paying any attention to him. But in that first debate, something clicked in me. Do you guys remember what the first question they threw at him? The question came from Megyn Kelly, who said, you have called women fat pigs, dogs, slobs, and disgusting animals. What do you have to say for yourself? The whole room gasps. We're all gasping at home. And President Trump calmly leans over and says, only Rosie O'Donnell. <laughs> and the whole room <laughs> erupts in laughter. So I'm at home, I'm laughing, and it was in that moment, strangely, that I said, that's the guy. That's the guy who's going to take on the Democrat establishment, the GOP establishment, and most importantly, the fake news media. Because I understood <clears throat> that our biggest obstacle as conservatives in restoring our nation is the lying fake news media. So needless to say, I was on the Trump train. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I was on the Trump train and I started following him and I started hearing on the media that Trump tweeted this, Trump tweeted that. I was like, let me get on this Twitter and find out what he's saying for myself. So I get on Twitter and once I got on there, I got connected with other conservatives. I start tweeting my own tweets. The next thing you know, I start getting hundreds of thousands of followers. The next thing you know, President Trump is retweeting me. The next thing I'm invited to events. The next thing you know, I'm at the White House taking a selfie with the President of the United States. <laughs> and if you, would have, if you would have told me that as a little girl growing up in Zimbabwe, I would have said, that's fake news. <laughs> so we had four years of President Trump. He was making America great. 
and then 2020 happened. We have COVID, and then we have the George Floyd riots, um, well, the George Floyd tragedy. And we all remember how the left took advantage of that and chose that as an opportunity to smear this great nation as a systemically racist and evil country. And it was a turning point in our country because for the first time, this narrative that I used to hear in the far left corners of Twitter and academia that America is systemically racist became mainstream because I was starting to hear it in my everyday life amongst family members, friends, and even my own pastor who was now starting to post about his white privilege on social media. He was even putting Black Lives Matter decals on the windows of the church. I was in shock because as somebody who follows politics very closely, I know that Black Lives Matter is a Marxist organization. They're anti-family, they're anti-Christ, they're anti-American, and they, they do absolutely nothing for the black community. But then I realized that the average person doesn't really know this because you know they get their little sound bites from the media and they don't really follow this. So I got really frustrated with all the ignorance that was around me. And in my frustration, the Lord spoke to me and said, write a book about it. So I did. I was obedient and I wrote a book and it's called Choice Privilege. Now, Choice Privilege is a play on the words white privilege. I cross out where it says white and I write in the words choice. Because in America, I have found that it is not the color of your skin that determines your destiny and the quality of your life. It is the choices that you make that chart the course of your life. Yeah. Now, in researching for my book, that's when I discovered that, you know, the left was using critical race theory um, as an ideological framework. And I'm sure most of you have heard about it because it's a raging topic right now, at least in the last few months. And basically, it just smears all white people as racist and evil, and all black people as oppressed, helpless victims. So not only is critical race theory false, it is in itself a racist ideology. And it is the antithesis of what Martin Luther King preached. Martin Luther King said that it is not the color of your skin that determines who you are. It is the content of your character. Now, unfortunately, critical race theory has embedded itself in every sphere of American society. It's in our education system, it's in our media, it's in our entertainment, it's now even in our churches, and now even in the military, which is scary. So, how do we fight back against this? I've come up with three practical things that each of us can do to fight back against critical race theory and this agenda to racially divide and conquer America. Number one is we need to stop being afraid to speak up. We need to stop being afraid to speak up. Wherever critical race theory is showing itself, we need to speak up against it. That means in our schools, at our workplaces, at our churches, we need to stand up against it. Number, oh, and I've seen, have you, have you guys seen those mama bears that are fighting out there with, uh, against critical race theory? I love that, that has really encouraged me. Yes, and number two is we need to educate ourselves about what critical race theory is because we need to, to fight our enemy, we need to know our enemy. And critical race theory is actually far deeper and more sinister. But I actually wrote a book that kind of breaks down the complexity of what's happening with race in America in a way that is easy enough for even a teenager to understand. And lastly, we need to become politically activated. We need to stop looking at politics as a spectator sport. That means we need to be calling up our elected officials, holding them accountable, putting pressure on them to ban critical race theory. That means phone calls, emails, written letters. That means um, showing up in person. And I am so thankful for Governor Ron DeSantis for leading the charge on critical race theory. And, and many, many states are following suit, so we are making a big difference with what we're doing. So thank you so much. We're making a difference. Uh, and I think the devil may have just overplayed his hand with this issue because he has awakened a sleeping giant is what I'm seeing. 
So let's keep the momentum. If each of us do our own little small part, our collective efforts can really make change on this issue. So thank you so much for listening. Please stop by and see me at my booth. I have my book choice privilege. I'm gonna be signing copies for it, for it for about an hour. So thank you so much for listening. God bless you and God bless America. Thank you.